Welcome back to another edition of the In the Game interview series. We've got Vlad Bagaru here for us today from University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Vlad wants to take some time, tell us about your playing experience, coaching experience, and how long you've been in your current role. Well, I've been here for, uh, this will be my uh, sixth season coming up. Uh, I started the program here. I used to be at South Carolina State before, and, and they brought me down here to start the program from scratch. So that's been a, an adventure in itself. Uh, originally, I'm from uh, Romania. I moved here when I was a young boy. Uh, ended up settling in North Carolina. Uh, I played at Cary High School, which, uh, you know, is down there where I grew up in Cary. And then I ended up playing at Brevard College uh, near Asheville. Um, and, uh, you know, since then, you realize you try to make it as a player in different, different levels. Uh, you probably have reached your, the level that you can play at, so you, you never really made it past it. So coaching was an aspect thing. Started coaching, um, got my first break with uh, Dave Sexton at Lewisburg College in the college game, and then Alex Hernandez, who used to be the uh, director of coaching at Carolina United a long time ago, uh, which became Triangle Football Club. Um, he gave me my first shot as well, and that's kind of how I started, uh, moving up with the coaching badges and, and, and those types of things, and, you know, had a few breaks along the way and um, ended up coaching uh, pretty much at every level. I've coached at every college level, for example, and uh, now I'm, I'm lucky to be here in Texas. Um, it's a good setup and, uh, and a good job. Very nice, very nice. Um, before we get too far into things, I uh, was told to tell you that one of our good friends, uh, Andy Stokes, says hello, and uh, he's my coaching director here at Moose River. Um, so uh, he wanted me to tell you he said hello. He's a great guy. <laughs> great guy, great guy for sure. Great person to work with and for, for sure. Um, so obviously you've coached at all the different levels of the college game. Um, you've also done some, some coaching internationally as well. Uh, what, what kind of experiences have you had with that? Well, I've been um, very fortunate when I was about 25 years old. Um, I, I was coaching Meredith College in, in Raleigh. And uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of expand my, my, you know, my coaching experience. So I wrote an email to every single Caribbean nation in, in uh, you know, in CONCACAF. And I basically wanted to work some summer camps or summer work or do something over the summer that sounded exotic and pretty cool for a 25 year old. So it ended up that uh, the Virgin Islands emailed me back and the US Virgin Islands, they said they're looking for somebody. Um, they wanted somebody on trial, three months. So I quit my job, off I went. Um, three months there turned into two years where I was technical director, national team coach. I started women's soccer there, for example, from, from the grassroots up. Uh, we, we did our first national team game when I was there. So basically just a, a grassroots type situation. Um, only full-time coach there, coached everything from elementary school kids to the senior men's national team and anything in between. Um, that led to an opportunity a few years later with uh, the Grenadian Football Association. Um, I was the assistant men's national team coach at Grenada. Got to play against the United States when Bruce Arena was coach in World Cup qualifiers, uh, which was uh, in Columbus and then back in Grenada. And I was there for a year, um, after which, uh, you know, there was a, a change in the head coach, which meant the assistants were changed as well. Um, then my last two international appointments were kind of part-time gigs that I've uh, combined with my, with my college here at UTRGV. Um, I was able to go down to St. Vincent and the Grenadines for a month uh, about three years ago to help them with preparation for the Windward Islands Football Association Tournament. And last year, I did a whole year as the uh, Moldovan under-15 national team coach uh, with the Moldovan Football Federation, uh, which was, uh, you know, an unbelievable experience coaching in Europe and um, able to combine that with my club duties here. Yeah, that's, that's those are some great experiences for sure. I think it, it's, it's awesome that, uh, you know, the, the British, Vir the, the Virgin Islands uh, stuff just came about just kind of, kind of putting yourself out there. You know, I think that's, that's something that, that a lot of coaches uh, talk about for young coaches uh, as we've gone through these interviews is really, it, you, you, you're going to be told a lot in this profession, but you never know if you don't ask, right? Yeah, exactly. And it, to be honest, it's all about taking risks sometimes. Um, you know, I think the way to get ahead a lot of times in coaching is, is to take a risk. It may become a massive failure, 
Um, you know, for example, even when I was Belmont Abbey coach, Division Two, we were quite a successful Division Two team. Um, I was trying to make the leap to Division One, and it, it's hard to make that leap. Um, you know, for whatever reason, athletic directors may not look at D2 coach or D3 coaches in the same light as they look as an assistant from, from some Division One. So the only way I could do it is take over at South Carolina State, which at the time was basically the worst team in the country. Uh, I think I was the only applicant, to be honest. And, um, you know, that gave me an opportunity to put my foot in Division One, and I made something out of that. But, you know, that's a risk that maybe not everyone can take. And, and I think I give that advice to a lot of young coaches. Take risks and uh, see what happens. You know, it could turn out quite well. Yeah, I can attest to, to what South Carolina State was before you got there because uh, – Whenever I was a first-year assistant, we went down with with a good Mount Olive team and beat them five nothing as a Division two team playing a Division one team. So um, I can attest that when you went down there and when you left, it was a very very different program for sure. Yeah, it was it was an experience in itself as well. Like all coaching jobs are, you know, there's some challenges and then and, and um, you know some some real pleasures and uh, you know there's no perfect job otherwise you know it would still be there. For sure, for sure. When you, uh, obviously, you, they brought you in to, to start the program there at, at uh, Rio Grande Valley. Um, what kind of lead time did they give you before you guys started? And, and where, where did you get started when you first took the job over? What was one of the first things that you wanted to do there? Well, I mean, the, uh, I was given a year. So I was hired in May um, 2013. This first season was in 2014. So they gave me a, a year and, and a few months to, to build a program. Um, I think the, the first thing you should do in any environment like that is, and if you're fortunate enough to have assistance, is to bring in some top quality assistance, you know, the team behind the team. Um, and I was able to bring in my assistant from South Carolina State, one of my two assistants from South Carolina State. He's still with me here. Um, and uh, another uh, young assistant from North Carolina named Lindsey Vera, used to work for Castle, uh, is now the head coach at Texas Southern. So... I think that's the first step is surround yourself with, with the best quality that you can, you can find, um, people that you can trust. I think that's, that's the number one key. Um, and then once they're in, uh, we can start building the program um, and finding the right players. Obviously, we started on a, um, on a four-year cycle of scholarships. So we started with three scholarships, then we went to six, then we went to 10, and now the, after the fourth year, we were fully funded at 14. So the first couple of years, I, I found very difficult, uh, you know, trying to compete and then and bring players in uh, in, a, in a pretty pretty decent conference. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting now that I feel like we're a pretty established Division One team and, and, and we're, you know, solid mid-major with four winning seasons back to back to back to back. Um, that if we look back at, at what it was in the first two, three years and what it is now, it's, it's, it's amazing what we accomplish as a staff and, and, and as the players. Um, and now we're trying to get better players. We're, we're starting to, to have kind of a different name and people start knowing us. Um, so it's an exciting adventure. I don't know if I'd do it again, but um, starting a program from scratch is, is um, it's a, it's a once in a lifetime experience. It's, it's neat, it's my baby. Yeah, I think it's it, it always it always holds a, a very special piece when you can say you're the, the only coach that's been there for now. No. And I just signed a new deal, so I'll be here for a few more years, I assume, and we'll go from there. Yeah, I think, um, and, and like you said, you guys have started to really kind of get things going there. You had had a great win uh, over the University of Miami. Uh, was it year before last? Yeah, it was in 2018. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember watching the highlights of that game. That was uh, that was a fun game to watch. Yeah, I was. Uh, that's probably one of my uh, best moments coaching. I think it was uh, at their place, ESPN game. You know the the whole the whole thing, and then we had a bit of good fortune. Um, I think they took us quite lightly. They probably didn't even know who you were. You know, not that well known by name. So it was it was a good 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 moment for us. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of, of getting to coach against you when you were at Belmont Abbey, and I think um, watching, watching your teams play at Rio Grande Valley, you kind of play a very similar style to kind of what you play at the Abbey as well. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you view as the way that you try to have your team play? Well, I mean, see, when, when, um, when potential players always ask us, like, what style do you play? And I want to be honest with them. I think we play a mixed style. 
I don't think we, we, you know, focus on one particular way of playing. Now, what we try to do as part of our, our model of play, our game model, is, is to play one way at home and one way um, on the road. Uh, you know, we here, down here in, in the Rio Grande Valley, it's very hot. Um, you know, temperatures can be quite, quite high and then Sunday at one o'clock. So we, we try to play, keep the ball quite a lot in, these, in, the, in, these, in this environment, this climate where the opposition has to run a lot. For instance, we average about 469 passes at home. But away, when we play away, we may play a little more direct, uh, sit in a bit deeper. Um, you know, it varies from opponent to opponent, but uh, we want to get as, as diverse as we can in our approach and um, perhaps even change during games. It's kind of where we want to take the program to and, and, and be able to switch ideas and philosophies throughout the 90 minutes. Um, we probably haven't got there yet, but um, you know, I feel we, we play a, an attractive style of soccer, especially at home, but we're not married to a particular way of play. I, I, I think this is a results business and we, we have an idea that we can be more expansive and, and more, um, you know, more possession oriented at home. Uh, and perhaps on the road, we take less risk. Um, and that's kind of how, how, how we, we play it. And probably very similar how we have my teams have played throughout the years. Um, you know, we kind of just adapt it for the opponent and then and, and try to, to put ourselves in the best situation to win the game. Very nice. You know, you talked a little bit about, you know, your, your average passes per game. Uh, obviously, analytics are, are, are huge and becoming even larger uh, in, in the college game. Um, what, are, what are some of the analytics that you really pay attention to with your girls? And, um, and, and what, what systems do you use to kind of get those to, to put into play? Mm -hmm. We're very um, fortunate that we have a, a budgetary situation that allows us to buy, um, to buy certain software. So for instance, obviously we, we use the Instat software for, for direct statistical match analysis. Um, I think it's a uh, unbelievable um, software. We can look at any aspect of our game. Uh, we can look at passes where, they're, where the most common combinations are, you know, what, what type of attacking pass are we making? Anything we can think of, it's all associated with the video. So the feedback we give to the players is excellent. Um, we started using something called Player Maker. Um, it's more for, um, you know, a lot of the players, they don't like, they weren't too comfortable wearing the, the classic heart rate monitors over the chest. So Player Maker is an Israeli company that came out. It, it's, it's, a, it's a motion sensor on the, on the soccer shoe, on the boot. Uh, it gives us pretty good physical data, physical output data. Um, tells us um, amount of sprint work, high velocity work, anything we would get from a, from a regular GPS system for the most part, uh, which allows us to, to periodize, pure, uh, I'm losing my train of thought there. Um, it allows to, to create a, a model for each player where they can, um, they can be fit and also fresh. And that helps a lot. And then we use Soccer Pulse uh, for perceived exertion rates and then how they feel. And all three combined, give us a pretty good system uh, in terms of how each player um, work output is. And then we're able to adjust it as we need for each training session. Um, overall, I think the more data we have, the easier it is to coach this day and age. I think we're in a, we're in a world of little, little lawyers. Everyone has is, is got an opinion about their performance. Uh, it's no longer possible for the coach to just give his or her opinion. You must have some other method to convince the players. The players need to have input. The players need to be part of the process. The, when we played, the coach spoke and we did. And that's it. And that's no longer the case. I think we have to be able to have substance to our, to our argument and proof of our argument. Um, and I think that's what data does. And I think that's the biggest benefit of it. Yeah, I think... Um... Obviously, we're not in, in quite as good of a budgetary situation as, as you are there. Uh, we did uh, we did soccer polls this past year. That was my first year using it, and I felt like it, it gave us uh, gave us some very valuable data um, to where we could really kind of uh, we could really really concentrate more individually on what we wanted players doing during training sessions. Uh, and there was times where we just had players flat out not train because it was going to be more beneficial for them to get the breaks than to, to continue to push themselves when we knew we had a game in two days. So, 
Um, I think that that's definitely something that, that I, as a coach, am trying to, to get more into. Uh, we get a little bit of the inside stuff from some of our opponents. But they're they're uh, gracious enough to share with us when they've got it. Uh, but I haven't haven't got to use that as much. Yeah. And it, to be fair, like it, it, the, the college soccer schedule is is crazy. You know, we play Friday Sundays here, and to me, Friday Sunday like that's it's unbelievably difficult. And we have a lot of European players that, that play for us, and and we have to explain to them like, oh yeah, we play Friday Sunday here, and they 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 at first they can't get their their minds around it. So the way we tailor each training session and their amount of work and rest and, and the type of training each player does per position is, um, I think it's very important to try to get through a season that, that, that is very quick with too many games. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I'll be uh, very, very interested to see if uh, the 21st century model gets approved and if it does, how that will uh, take, take the college game going forward, sure. Yeah. Especially, I wonder on the women's side what 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 effect it would have on the women's side um, if the men do it. Will the women follow? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I think it, it'd be very, very. I think it'd be very difficult from a Title IX perspective to have one do it without the other. Correct. So I think if if it gets pushed, I think it'll it'll kind of tr- trickle down through through all the levels. Obviously, that's that's kind of been tabled now with uh, with all the the coronavirus stuff going on. So. Yeah. We'll have to continue to wait and see if that, that, that happens or not. A lot of things have been tabled now with the coronavirus situation, so you know we have to do our best with it. Very true. What uh what things have you as a as a program been doing with your players uh with your current situation? Well, what we've tried to do is is we have um we have fifteen returners, fifteen returning players. Um, so we've obviously done the, the Zoom calls, we do them individually and as a group. Uh, tomorrow we'll do one. We have a NWSL player that's going to come talk to him over the Zoom call, talk about you know, fitness and nutrition and the, the right things and living the right way. Um, but, I mean, for the most part, we've tried to give him different analysis, a uh, little homework. Um, you know, we have a, we have a very um, structured game model that we use here. Um, it has certain principles of play, attacking, defending. Um, each of them are associated with video, so we, we kind of put together a presentation on that. And they've, most of them have seen it to some extent, but we try to get a little more in-depth and then have individual conversations on it. We're going to do the same thing with some of our set pieces next week um, and how we, we organize our set pieces and their positional roles within those set pieces. Um, we've done those things. Obviously, they have some supplemental workouts that they have to do, um, you know, per NCAA rules that we, we provide to them. Um, but it's frustrating because, you know, you're not there day-to-day with them. Um, you know, I think we have a good mix of, of players who will take any time away and, and prepare themselves in a professional way. And we have some that, that most likely won't. And then they'll have some challenges if and when the season starts. Um, so we try to give them, keep them as engaged as possible. Um, you know, all their classes are online, which for some is good, for some not so good. Um, so there's a lot of things that we, we can do, but um, I think we've, we've done our best to, to be able to keep them as engaged as possible. Yeah, I think the, the thing that I probably miss the most is just being around each other with my group. We've got, we've got such a, a, a fun, a fun, enjoyable group uh, with my people that I just, uh, I mean, we only got to train twice this spring. We got back from spring break, we started our, our actual sessions. We got two days in and then we were done. And then you're so, done. Kind of like, well, I think that I think that we had a good two days, uh, but but it's the first two days, so you would expect that. Um, so it's uh it's just a little little frustrating to to not be able to, to continue to play. You know, work with those players day in day out is is my favorite part of the job. Uh, you know, I I, I like the uh, the training ground work the most. That's my favorite part, and um, you know, it's it's tough when that's taken away. It, it's it's very challenging for for coaches that especially, you know, people that are, this is what we do day in, day out. And so we take that away. We kind of left, left a little empty. Yeah, no, I can definitely identify with, with the empty part. My wife is ready for soccer to start back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, even though she's got to hear some very, very good coaches talk uh, from the other room. <laughs> um, so what, what's, uh, what's one of your favorite, favorite activities to do with your team? I tell you, that's a, uh, I thought about this uh, a little bit. Um, 
if you would ask this question, I thought, well, I'm gonna give you an activity that I, that perhaps isn't, you know, it, it works mostly on the decision making of the players. Um, you know, I like working a lot with with our defensive structure and then where to press and how to press and our overall shifting and all those things. Those are great, but I like um, and I've seen you. I'm sure everybody's seen this game at some point in their career, and you can play it in different ways, different numbers. What we call it the 21 game. It's uh, it's about getting 21 one touch passes, um, not consecutively, but throughout the the exercise. And whoever gets it first can go to goal and score. Play one goal, first goal wins. Um, you know, sometimes there's moments they have to take two, three, four touches, dribble. At times they have to play one touch. The opposition's forced to press, so you can get quite a lot of it. Um, the intensity is quite good. Uh, it helps players make decisions quickly. Um, and as coaches, we can create an environment that 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 forces. Um, you know the, the the recognition of time, the recognition of space, when we can we can we can hold the ball more, when we must play faster. Um, once we get to twenty one, can we transition the goal quickly and end the exercise? Um, I quite like it. That's probably one of my favorite exercises that we use. Um, I think it, you can do it in two three minutes. Very intense two three minutes. Um, first goal wins, and uh, it gets a lot of it. So twenty one one touch passes, not consecutive. First team to get it can score. Very nice. Play a little blackjack. Yeah, quite like that. Um, how, how have your, your college experiences uh, been, been different than, uh, than your international experience? Um, you know, it's, it's a little different uh, in many ways. Um, when I was full-time at the international level in the Virgin Islands and in Grenada, they, uh, you know, we were a small country, so you could work with most of the players on a semi-regular basis. So it's kind of like coaching a club team. Um, you know, in Moldova, recently here, I was, you know, coming back and forth every few months. Um, I think I did seven trips in total over the course of the year uh, between the, the tournament and some of the training camps. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we wouldn't see him, but four or five days, maybe have a game, and, and then we were out. So, you know, at the college level, our day-to-day -day interaction is constant. Um, if we make a mistake in recruiting, we bring a player, maybe that's not up to the standard. Uh, it's harder to get rid of them. You know, at the international level, we just don't select them for the next camp. It's very simple. Um, so there's pros and cons to it as well. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we, if you make a financial mistake here and you offer a large scholarship to a player who doesn't meet the requirements, maybe because you've either misidentified her or she just hasn't adapted to the environment, the new environment that she's in, that's a pretty big hit for, for, for a program, you know, that's, that's results-based. Uh, at the national team level, if you have a discipline issue or the player isn't up to, to the standard, you could just simply not select them, and, and it makes life a little easier. Um, but I do enjoy the day-to-day -day interaction. I think we can do more. Um, I think we can, uh, we can prepare the team a bit better, um, having, having more time together than we would in a five or six day training camp where the players are coming from different clubs, um, where maybe those club systems aren't very developed. You know, I'm talking about women's soccer in, in Eastern Europe. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate now that I'm in a program where we can attract some, some good players and, um, you know, have a pretty professional environment for the most part. When you were working with, with Moldova, uh... How was the level? Do you feel like that, that some of those players could probably come and fit into to a program like yours? Yeah, I think there's, there's certainly maybe up to three players that could, that could play at Division One level. Um, you know, we're talking about 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds that, that are, are still young. Um, there's one particular player that was there that, that, that I think is, is, you know, she's got, a, she's got a very good career ahead of her. Um, and hopefully one day she'll, she'll be able to come play in the States or whatever else she wants. Uh, and maybe one or two others, if they, if they progress in the game and then progress at an international level, they could, they could play at a, at a mid-major level. Um, certainly not at a power five type institution. There's probably not any player that has the, both the athletic and the technical um, requirements for that level. But at mid-major, I think between two and three players, we could probably – probably get out, but it's challenging because English isn't very common. Most of them speak Russian, um, some speak Romanian. Um, so it's a, it's a more of a, more of a challenge in trying to get them out than, than their ability. Yeah. Understandable.
Um, you know, that one of the big things that's always talked about with the American game is, is how much our athleticism is part of it and how much we rely on it. How different was it coaching the Eastern European players as far as the athleticism and, and was it was it more technical? Uh, was the athleticism close? What do you, what do you think? Um, I mean, Moldova, Moldova specifically is a developing country. I mean, women's soccer is, you know, is developing. Uh, it's not quite in, in its infancy, but it's, it's still got a ways to go. Um, the biggest problem, of course, is at the club level, um, trying to get players to, to train on a regular basis and, and, and play on a regular basis under, under good coaching. Um, so sometimes they, they, they're, of course, they're a very poor country, which, which also, you know, forces kids a lot of times to, to work, um, forces their parents to be overseas working while they're living by themselves. We had a number of players that lived on their own at 15 years old because their, player, their parents were in France working on the farms with old people's houses, uh, homes. Um, so it was challenging in that respect. Uh, you know, I remember um, maybe it was a second camp. We brought in maybe 28 players. And, um, you know, we had a few that probably didn't belong there. Um, and then when camp ended, you know, a couple of them were crying because they had to go back to their conditions in their village where there was no running water. And there was tough, tough life. And in their camp, they had bed, shower, food at, at pretty high conditions. So there's those challenges that, that also affect your preparations. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's an infancy, the levels, there's probably a good core group that I think um, are, are, you could say they're good players. They could play on a, on a ECNL team or you know, DA team when that used to be around. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, the level isn't super high. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's kind of what I, I thought, but I, I wanted to hear it for sure. You know, um, you know, I, it's crazy to think about uh, living living alone at 15 years old. I know that if, if I was left alone at 15 years old, I definitely wouldn't be where I am now for sure. Yeah, and 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 if if I'm not mistaken, I believe only two or three players have both of their parents is at home. They either have one parent overseas or both. Um, you know, one of our I remember one of our forwards. Both of her parents lived in France. She lived with her brother. Her brother was a year older. He was 16. She was 15. And they lived on their own. And they've been doing that for a couple of years. So many of them were living with grandparents. Uh, you know, and it varied on conditions financially. Some, some were a little better off than others. Others, you know, had to, had to walk down to the well to get water because there was no running water in the house. Yeah, I think that that kind of puts, puts things in perspective for us, especially as, as college coaches. You know, our kids uh, – Compared to that, where they can be a, a bit spoiled at times. Yeah, I mean, and that's 100% right. And even, you know, even in the, the, within the divisions and within, you know, even within between the South Carolina State and here, the conditions we have here compared to South Carolina State's night and day. Our, my players don't know what it was like when at Belmont Abbey and at South Carolina State and some of the conditions that they've had. Um, here, you know, we're treated really well. We're very fortunate, um, you know, but budget talks so some people can and some people can't yeah yeah i think it obviously just varies from school to school situation, situation public school to private school all that all that stuff for sure mm -hmm. what's uh what's one of your favorite coaching memories well i think i have um i have two really that i like to share uh certainly in 2018 when we played uh, the university of miami that that certainly is a is a moment that i, I won't forget I think we showed up in. Uh, I think we showed up in the um, in, in the stadium there, and, and I'm not sure if every player from the University of Miami knew who they were playing that day. Um, you know, we conceded a goal in the first half. You know, we, we took a very defensive approach. We sat back, played four one four one, tried to get them. You know, tried to find spaces on the counter. Um, and uh, you know, as the second half went on, uh, we might we played a little bit higher in the second half. Um, you know, they, they got a little frustrated. They missed some chances and we scored an equalizer um, and the game really evened up there. Um, and then when we scored the winner in overtime, it was like the world stopped. I, I never forget that. I didn't want to leave the field. Um, I felt that that was probably one of the best moments I've had as a coach, um, you know, just because the name and, and the environment that you're in. And when I was Virgin Islands national team coach years ago, um, and this is kind of what the game means to me, um, we went to play Haiti in Haiti. Uh, they hosted a group. Um, we're with our um, 
senior men's national team, and we went to play Haiti um, in our first game. And, and I've been to Haiti twice now, and it's, it's certainly the poorest country I've ever been to. Conditions are dire, uh, very challenging. Um, and we go out, and there's probably about 15,000 people to watch this game between the Virgin Islands and Haiti. And uh, the national anthems start. And uh, their national anthem starts. And we had 14,000 plus people singing this anthem together. And it gave me chills because I thought, here we go, you know, for, the, for 90 minutes, everyone's equal. Everyone's equal. Um, socially equal, politically equal, economically equal for those 90 minutes. And uh, I thought that was something that, that I'll never forget. Um, that moment where you could, the game could equalize you in, in any aspect. It doesn't matter if the United States is playing Haiti, for that example, or whoever. They're equal at the beginning of that game from a political, social, and economical standpoint. And uh, I love that about the game. I love that about the game. Yeah, I think, you know, getting the, getting the opportunity to play for your country um, is, is obviously always a special one for sure. And I'm sure being a coach, coach in that environment is, uh, is amazing. Sure. Yeah, for sure. I spent, uh, whenever I was in high school, we went on a, a tour with my club team for 10 days and uh, went over to France and Germany and Switzerland. And we were playing in, in the French tournament. That's where the, the actual tournament we played. And so um, we were just the Americans. So it was it, it was a very, very small version of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, they didn't care that we were the team from Wilmington. We were, we were the Americans. Uh, and, if, and winning, winning the, the, show, the tournament was, was obviously a, a great experience, but um, something that that will always hold a special piece for me for sure. That's awesome. What uh, what do you feel like is one of the most important pieces of being a coach? Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's a lot of responsibility, and 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 it really is about, to me, it's about understanding of what what your job depends on. You know, I think we, we sometimes talk about all these other things about how we want to inspire and do these things, but ultimately, yes, those things are true, but ultimately our job depends on results at our level. If you're a youth coach, developing players. If you're the director of an MLS academy, how many players are you putting in the first team? That's what you're judged on. And us, and ultimately, we're judged on whether we win or lose. And, uh, you know, I stay employed and I, I, I am able to get better employment the more I, I, I'm successful. And I think we need to be very honest with ourselves as coaches about what that is, um, what the job is. Um, but to me, uh, if, if you want to be a successful coach, um, you know, no matter what, you know, no matter what your knowledge base is and your coaching qualifications, I think you have to really grasp the fact that you're responsible for a whole lot and your attention detail has to be extremely high. Nothing can really be left to chance. So for instance, now we're in this period of, of at home, stay home, shelter at home. And, um, you know, we should be preparing for the 2020 season and leaving nothing to chance. There should be no surprises because we have so much time. All our sessions, all the possible outcomes, as best as we can control them anyway. So obviously there's things that we can't plan on and then the game is unpredictable, but the small details that we can plan on and, and be extremely um, organized about, we should be able to have that perfect, especially in a period where there's no players, you're not going anywhere. So this is a time for coaches, I think, to really focus on how they're presenting this information that they want to get across to their players. Um, and that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to make sure that when this preseason starts, every single aspect from day one to the last game of the season is, is planned um, as best as we can. Yeah, I think uh, th this period's really kind of been a uh, big for professional development for me. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to, uh, to get, get as much information that I can try to process and figure out what will work for us and what, we, what won't work for us. And I mean, right now I've got the webinar screen recording on the computer beside me. So uh, you know, I'm just trying to kind of figure out how I can become a better coach while we yeah. do this. And I think uh, obviously these chats have, have been a big part of that as well. Uh, you, know, you talked a little bit about, about going through the coaching badges. Um, 
where are you at with your badges now? Um, what what do you what have you got? What are some of the important lessons you take from some of those courses? I mean, I've I think it's so important for coaches to to get this coach indication and get the the all their badges as much as they can they can get, um, especially the ones who maybe didn't have the the the, the highest playing career, um, which I did not. You know, I, I played at a small college in, in Western North Carolina. So I, I believe in coach education. I believe that, that we should seek it constantly, um, whether it's through badges or through webinars or the things that we always do. Um, you know, study. I've done a number of study sessions with, with clubs and, and going and shadowing coaches. But I think from a coaching uh, bad standpoint, you know, I went through the U.S. system as well as, as some of the European system. Um, you know, I'm on my United States USFA license. Um, I, uh, I'm at a point now though, where, where I want something more. Um, I think that, that there has to be a way to access the USSF pro license. If, if you're a women's coach in the college level, which I think is really extremely close to the pro level for the most part, because there is nothing else. There's the NWSL and what is there afterward, after that? You know, so the college level should certainly come into play and, and allow coaches to move on to the pro level. Um, you know, I would like to 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 do the UEFA A license. Um, you know, I'm, I'm you know, it's, I, I, to be fair, I, I probably should have done it already, but it's it's something that I uh, that I will pursue here in the next few years, um, having finished my B license a number of years ago. So um, that's really the next steps for me. I, I just like to be able to to be a different coach all the time. Um, I don't want to be the same coach I was at Belmont Abbey that I am now. And I don't want 20 years to look back of what I'm doing now and say, oh, you're doing the same thing. And if I am doing the same thing, then I haven't really progressed as a coach. Um, I remember being at Belmont Abbey and, and, and now I look back at myself then and I thought I was on top of the, the world as a coach. And now I look at some of the sessions I was doing and I said, I would never do that now. You know, that's terrible. And, um, that's the progression I think you make as a coach. Um, I've changed a lot of how I deal with players. Um, I think there was a, you could take a different approach 10, 15 years ago that you can't take now. Um, you know, the, the players don't respond to a, a top down type leadership, men or women. So it has to be a, a more inclusive, um, a more progressive way. And I think, um, you know, I've worked very hard at that. That's probably been the, the biggest change I've made last five, six years is trying to change myself into, um, you know, a different persona, different coach. Um, and I think you have to continue doing that to be successful. Yeah. I think, uh, I think the quote is either you're, uh, you're either improving or, or you're, I don't know, that's the one behind. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Yeah. There you go. Because uh, so you have to just continue to, to do those things to, to get the information and process it and and, um, and and find what fits for you. I think um, every every coach is going to be different, and you can't you can't be a carbon copy of somebody else and expect it to, to just just happen for you. Yeah, and and it's our responsibility as coaches to change. The players aren't going to change; they're going to stay the same age, really. If you continue working at the college at the college uh, at the college level, the players are going to be in the same age group. You're going to continue to get older, so it's your responsibility to adapt to them, not them to adapt to you. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things I've, I've done over the last seven, eight years is try to adapt myself to the players as best I can. And I, you know, I have my own personality. I have a, you know, a, a upbringing that makes me extremely black and white. Um, and, uh, you know, I try to explain that to the players from day one and say there's times when, you know, I'm not going to understand certain things because I am very black and white. But I also try to put that out there as early as I can about what I am and who I am. And hopefully we can have a dialogue and now we both better understand each other. And that's part of the process. Yeah, I think the, the honesty part goes a long way. I mean, with, without honesty, you can't have trust and respect. So, you know, I think in, in players, play, players are probably a bit smarter than they were uh, whenever I was a player. You know, my coach could have told me I was the worst player on the field and I was in like, uh, but now I think that you kind of you obviously don't want to present it that way, but you, that, that honesty of, of where players stand and, and how they need to improve to, to get really into the is, is huge. Right. And that's where we go back to what we talked in the beginning about data, the data that we use. 
And that data is needed for those discussions because no longer can the coach just say, I think the eye test is not enough, mm -hmm. right? So we use this data to, to, to back up, we use video to back it up. Yeah, with, with video, how much, uh, how much video do you use with the team and do you do it, do it individually or just as a team? I try to avoid uh, large team meetings um, outside of, of um, you know, pregame stuff. You know, we, we kind of drip feed the opponent to them th through the week, um, showing little clips throughout the week. Uh, you know, we, start, we can start with some, some individual players. We can look at some, some tendencies. We can look at their set pieces. And those things are kind of drip feed through the week. Um, and then at the, end of the, um, at the end of the week, the day of the game, we have a, a presentation, 15 to 20 minutes, about the opponent, which pretty much they've seen all these things on an individual, small group basis. Uh, I try to stay away from, uh, from team meetings um, as much as I can, like large group meetings where we just go over the video. I just don't like that. I don't think the players really respond to that. I think they respond better in small groups, individual groups. Um, we can get better. Um, Instat allows us to send us send them all their actions from the game in an email, and then we can discuss it that way as well. Um, so that helps. Um, but we try to do a lot during the week in small groups, positionally, some individual, and then um, at the end of the week, we, we, we kind of hopefully have given enough during the week that they can now see it together and, and, and move on. But I never like to give uh, criticism in front of the group always praise either videos we show in front of the group are always positive. Um, anything negative, any bad decisions, any mistakes, we'll do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, I remember when I first started coaching, one of my mentors was Ilya Tomajanov, right? He was old coach at Castle and, and, and was, was, a, was brilliant, way ahead of his time. And uh, he always said, there's no reason to even have a, a, a full group halftime discussion. But what's the point? He goes, they're not going to listen. So you bring in two, three at a time, you speak about what they want, and then halftime ends. And he was doing that with his Castle U18s in 1996, 97, way ahead of time. So um, I took that from him a little bit and then thought, well, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to be able to give feedback to players on a, on a small group, an individual basis, and they'll, they'll retain it better, especially if we can have video and technology, which at that time, we didn't. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how how we structure it. Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a piece that that um, we're trying to, to get better at as we as we kind of establish our coaching staff at peace. We're trying to do a lot more of those small things uh, where our, we're a little bit limited uh, with, with what we're able to to do with, with some of that stuff. Um, you guys film training sessions as well. We haven't filmed training sessions. We. It's, it's kind of something that we've thrown around here a few times. My, uh, my assistant is uh, Sue Vodica. Uh, now she used to be the University of South Carolina Aiken coach years ago. You might have competed against her. Um, she wanted to get a drone and film training from a drone, but we have quite windy conditions here a lot of times. So we kind of moved away from it. It's something that we would like to do. Uh, to be fair, we haven't done it. Yeah, we're, we're looking into a, a new video system with, with us in the men's program at Peace. Uh, it's called VO, um, and it just kind of digitally tracks everything. Um, it's one of those kind of like a kind of like Speedio where you can kind of zoom into different pieces of the field and stuff like that. I think that, that that's something that we're looking at trying to do so that way we can maybe film, film a little bit more and just try to give us give us a little a, a, a chance as coaches as well to see, you know, what worked well and what didn't work well throughout our practice. Yeah, I mean, that's the – to be fair, that's probably the um, the next step for for us here. Very nice, very nice. Um, what what advice do you have for young coaches? I mean, my best advice to coaches is is two things. I think um, be obsessed with it. You know, like you have to be obsessed with it. It can't. Um, don't fall into the lifestyle. Sometimes the lifestyle is pretty good. Uh, you know, we train in the morning here, so some coaches can choose to go home right after. Um, it's not, it's not how you do business. It's not how you're successful, uh, and take risks, you know, take risks, you know, go, go coach that team that's never won any games and, and see where that takes you. Um, travel, you want to coach in different parts of the world. I, you know, I've had coaches reach out to me. Well, how'd you do it? Well, I just try to make connections. I just try to get myself out there. I, I try to 
be proactive on social media. And, and one thing I learned from Gary Kurnine, of all people, you know, I don't know if you guys follow Gary Kurnine from Modern Soccer Coach, is how important social media is in, 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 uh, in the coaching world, you know, in terms of receiving information, also getting yourself out there. Um, so I think taking risks and being obsessed with the game, you know, being able to plan things and, and pay attention to details and try to improve yourself all the time. Um, you know, it's easy to fall into a lifestyle here that, that's relaxed, um, especially at, at, you know, even club or, or college levels. But, um, you know, that will take you so far and then you'll be found out. So I, I give coaches that advice. Take risks, number one. And then two, um, be obsessed with the game and, uh, you know, pay attention to those details and, 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 and be structured. Yeah, I think that's, that's great advice. You know, we, uh, we train in the afternoons at peace and, and typically, you know, at least three days out of the week. I'm in the office around 8 or 9 in the morning out on the field at four, four to six with the college girls, and then seven to, to eight thirty or nine with, with whatever club team I have at that time. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that's obviously a taxing, it can be taxing uh, towards the end of the seasons. Uh, but for sure, I think it goes back to the to being obsessed with it. I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. And I mean, we love what we do and, and we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do it to that level unless we were really in love with the game. And, and that's another thing. Like, you have to love the game because at one point it does become a job um, if you stay out long enough. And, and there's frustrations. It's a real bittersweet game. You know, the, the highs are so high and the lows are so low. And, uh, you know, I just – one of the reasons I coach is I always search for that high, you know, that, that sense of happiness and relief when you win a game. And, uh, you know, it's, it's – uh, you got to be able to love the game to be able to do that day in, day out. And if you don't, uh, after X amount of time, you'll, you'll back away from it. For sure, for sure. We're glad. We, uh, we really appreciate you taking some time to talk with us. Um, you know, we really, really look forward to what you continue to build there at Rio Grande Valley. And, um, you know, we hope, hope that we're able to get back on the soon. I look, look forward to, to catching some of your games this, this fall. So I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks so much.